Hey, welcome back to Axe and Root Homestead. I'm Angela and today we are in the garden because I want to talk to you about how we organic garden and have an integrative pest management system in place in order to keep our um, crops thriving and producing high yields without using a whole bunch of chemical or invasive practices. So there are four different uh, groupings of actions that people can take to protect, protect their garden from pests. One, the first one is cultural, which is creating a proper environment for a healthy seedling to grow and thrive. The second would be physical, like a fence. The third is biological, like bringing in beneficial insects. And the fourth is chemical. We practice three of those different tiers in the homestead. We do not use chemicals. So let's start with cultural pest prevention. So the first thing that I believe in when it comes to setting your plants up for success in the garden is to create healthy soil. Healthy soil creates healthy plants and a healthy plant is gonna be a lot stronger and naturally to some extent to be able to protect themselves from a pest invasion. Now there are other things I do than just let the plants sort of fend for themselves. I also interplant. I practice polyculture. So what that means is I don't just dedicate a section of my garden and say this is the garlic bed, this is the broccoli bed. I interplant the garlic and the broccoli because cabbage moths that drop those eggs and those nasty squishy green caterpillars in our brassicas like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, Romanesco hate the smell of the allium family crops, which are garlic, onion, shallots, scallions, chives, that sort of thing. If you interplant them together, they have a wonderful companion planting relationship and it helps to disguise the scent of the brassicas and the cabbage moths can't find them. So it's a good thing. The next thing that I do is in every single bed, I plant flowers and I plant herbs because herbs a lot of times give off a strong scent and they also flower, such as chamomile, calendula, and um, lavender. So when we have flowers in a bed, not only are we using the scent of those flowers to deter some insects that hate those, but also we're attracting pollinators and lots of those pollinators are predators but we'll talk about that in the biological section. Something else that we do here at the farm is rotate our crops and that has a lot to do with soil health as well and you can see some of that in um, my first video on carbon but it also is a huge effort and goes a long way in preventing pests in the garden. Let me give you an example. I like to plant pumpkin seeds in compost. So I plant, plant the pumpkin seeds directly in and around my compost heap. Well, I did that two years in a row. And um, I thought, okay, you know what? It's all new compost getting added to the heap. It's like different soil, it's gonna be well. It wasn't. Because those females of the um, squash bug family had overwintered in the soil and ended up coming up and finding the new pumpkin plantings and went to town and I had hardly any pumpkins that year. So crop rotation is pivotal, not just for soil health, but also for pest management control. The other thing that I do, and it's easier said than done, especially in the summertime when we're busy, is to weed. So if you think about weeds and how they can get really big and kind of flop over into a garden bed next to your plant, you've just created a highway for bugs and unwanted insects to get right up close next to your crops. So weeding is also super helpful. I wanna show you one other method that I implement for cultural planting, and then we'll move on to physical barriers. It can be a little hard to get your head around the idea, at least it was for me, of sacrificing a crop on purpose to pests, but it works. It's called trap cropping. This is my cabbage bed. I have covered all of it with the exception of one. Now the row cover's job is to protect from cabbage worms and cabbage moths laying those cabbage worms, but I left one out on purpose because in the event that a cabbage moth is over here and is interested in messing around my row cover, she's gonna go for the one that has the easiest access, which is that cabbage crop right there. And she's gonna lay her eggs and the caterpillars are gonna eat it and they're all gonna stay there and it's gonna be great and the other ones are gonna look fine. So trap cropping works and it can be something that's practiced on a large farming scale. Okay, some other of my favorite examples of cultural practices to put in place is again, looking at companion planting such as um, to prevent cucumber beetles, plant radishes around the cucumber. 
they hate the smell and it helps to keep them away. When you're planting tomatillos, peppers, tomatoes, sprinkle coffee grounds on the top of the soil right around the seedling when planting and it helps to keep flea beetles away. Um, nasturtiums are amazing for planting alongside squash bugs. I just learned that recently and I will be implementing that in the garden this year. Um, and nasturtiums are great just period throughout the garden for attracting pollinators and deterring unwanted insects. So when it comes to physical pest management practices, the first thing that we implement is a fence. We have um, a board fence, a wood fence around the garden that is lined with deer fencing. So this helps to keep deer and unwanted critters and wildlife away. Sometimes though, you have smaller things that get through, uh, like gophers, and I've definitely experienced that. If you wanna know what has worked wonders for me, water motion sprinklers. This white panel here is a motion sensor. Down here is where the batteries go, and I hook it up to my hose, turn it on, and essentially anything that walks in front of it, be it a deer, person, cat, anything, it senses it and it starts shooting water. It's been a huge help to keeping wildlife away. Something else we implement that I talked about before, a physical barrier is row cover keeps those cabbage moths away. Also helps to eliminate some of the harsh sun rays after seedlings are initially planted and it can even help to keep moisture in this little space here. It also helps to keep them nice and warm and is a great season extender if you're looking to plant a little earlier or later in the gardening season. Other examples of physical barriers would be bird netting to keep uh, birds and little critters like squirrels and the water sprinklers help with that too. Out of my berry patches, I don't have any issues with that with strawberries. They stopped affecting my blueberries. Um, so those are certainly helpful. Okay, so I like to think of biological pest management as creating an ecosystem in the garden. So if I'm attracting things like wasps, which are predatory insects, they're gonna feed on things like those cabbage moths I talked about before. So if I plant dill next to my brassicas and I let it go to flower, it's gonna open up pollinators like wasps love that, they're attracted to it. And especially if it's right next to a broccoli plant and they see that squishy green caterpillar, they're gonna go for it and it's gone. So you actually wanna plant flowers, let herbs go to seed, do things that pollinators are attracted to, to try to pull them into the garden. I know they can be really scary. I actually hate wasps, even though I'm a beekeeper, but I know that they're doing a really important job and playing a big role. Cats are another uh, biological weapon when it comes to gardening because they control bulls, moles, and mice. I absolutely hate having my cats in the garden uh, after seedlings are established because they can smash things and um, they like to use some of the beds as a bathroom if I'm frank. So what I do is I let them in the garden until about this time when I start getting my seedlings really to take off and then I kick them out and the motion sprinklers help to keep them away. Anything that's been hibernating over the colder months in my garden is gone by now. And that's also thanks to the cats. Okay, ladybugs are great for aphids. Ladybugs love aphids and they eat a large number each day. And the great thing about ladybugs is if you release them, they will stay in your garden until all the aphids are gone. They won't leave until their food supply has completely diminished. We use ducks in the garden when it comes to snails and slugs. Now again, you wouldn't wanna do that with teeny tiny little seedlings because it would completely smash and annihilate them. In addition, ducks root around with their bills. And so that could be really harmful to a seedling because it doesn't have a very deep root system. You don't want them to uproot your seedlings. The other thing, is pill bugs. Now I've actually had, especially because I use compost in my garden, pill bug overages where they, pill bugs are by nature um, like destructors. They break things down and they help with the decomposition cycle. So if I am practicing such garden sanitation, if there's a cabbage leaf that falls and I don't leave it in place, the pill bugs need something to do. If there's nothing to break down, they're gonna start breaking down my healthy crops. Believe me, I've had them go after my radishes in earnest before. So the best thing to do is just leave some of the things in place. Now, obviously if it's diseased like a tomato, you don't wanna return blight to the soil, but letting plants and crops die in place in the fall takes pill bugs a long time over the winter and in the spring to break down and all those nutrients are returned to the soil. So you do want to leave them some forage and food in the garden in order for them to leave your healthy seedlings and crops alone. And so then that brings us to the fourth group, which is chemical pest prevention. We do not practice that here at the farm. I don't even use organic sprays 
everything that I do is completely and totally all natural because I would much rather try to encourage personally um, strong soil, healthy plants, and I do want to keep some insects in here that I think are beneficial. Not even diatomaceous earth in my garden because diatomaceous earth is fossilized diatoms and what they do is when you sprinkle it on the garden it helps with slugs and snails and such anything with soft skin because it abrades the skin but here's the thing diatomaceous earth can't tell the difference between an earthworm which is super important to soil structure and then those slugs and snails so that is our different levels of pest management we keep here in the garden just striving to create an ecosystem and not trying to control nature but instead trying to encourage and work with it. All right, I hope that's been helpful. Stay tuned for tomorrow. We're gonna talk about sheep and why they are important here on the homestead. And I am also going to very briefly touch on the controversy of wool. Have a great day.